Should have clicked that. Clicked that a minute ago. Sorry, I lost my pointy stick. No, maybe specifically. Sorry, I lost my pointy stick. No, maybe. Good evening, everybody, or as I always say, morning, or whatever time it is, wherever you are watching, and a very warm welcome to what I think is our fifth open clock club live stream and if you've been following along you will know that um we are working on this early 19th century european long case or tall case clock and um we got to the stage last week where we were discussing some of the potential repairs that we might do and that was i found really good fun to kind of understand how different people think about things. And that is really the order of events uh, this week as well, to kind of gauge opinion and importantly to engage you all in this uh, process. So um, last week we got a nice list of repairs that um, might need doing to return the object to working order and remember that is our aim here the camera's a bit wobbly um that's our aim here remember we want to we made a kind of universal decision to return the clock to working order and that's about it really and what that means of course is open to discussion to debate to dialogue because um that means different things to different people so uh, irrespective of what we feel the kind of context of this clock was or might have been is all conjecture what we now think we know at least depending on our version of reality is that we are going to take the clock apart we're going to wash it to remove the kind of dust and dirt and as i always say spiders webs and everything and um we're going to crack on with those repairs. Oh, and by the way, if you have uh, just started your Easter break, um, which I know won't be everybody, then uh, have a great holiday, won't you? And um, en enjoy a bit of downtime after a, what seems to have been a pretty long and dark winter. If you're still working through the Easter, as we will be here at How to Repair Pendulum Clocks, then uh, you're not alone. You can always join us on Facebook, remember? And uh, we've got a bit of exciting, oh, we've always got exciting news and you've got exciting news. So I see the live chat is up and running. So that's great. So welcome to you live chatters. Please let us know uh, what you think as we go along. And of course, don't forget to say hi to team How to Repair Pendulum Clocks. Okay, so we identified about, oh, I've got a list somewhere, eight or ten uh, repairs from last week. And, but before we can address those, we need to tear the clock apart. And as you can see, uh, the clock's a little bit rusty. Um, so we know that some of the screws and some of the pins and all that stuff are not going to come apart that easily. So what I'm just going to begin by doing is by touching those uh, parts that might be difficult to get apart with a bit of uh, paraffin or um, penetrating oil or something like that. I'm going to actually use paraffin. I'll put the 
YouTube thing out of the way. As much as the live uh, chat is really fascinating, it's also the best distraction ever. Lovely to see you there anyway. So just before I take it apart, a couple of things I noticed during the week when I was looking at this that I'd like to mention. Uh, firstly, and I've lost my pointy stick for the second time in 10 minutes. Oh, here it is. That's good. Um, I'm just uh, messing about with the camera, trying to get it to stop wobbling. So much. Mm. Maybe a bit better, or maybe not. So there we are. Uh, the first thing I was going to mention was the rack hook here. And if we just go a little bit closer, there we go. Um, we, oh, well, it's quite good fun actually to look at rack striking while we're here, might as well. Um, there's a, I did a video on rack striking and um, there's an interesting, an absolute relationship between the pitch of the teeth, the length of the uh, this radius here, the length of the rack arm to the pin, and then the steps on the snail. I won't go into that now, but just to point out that this case, the pin look does actually, it shares a common radius with the rack stood to center, uh, center arbor there which is the normal way. The, the clock in the video that we did uh, by Hindley, this value that the rack stood to uh, rack pin value is less than this center distance, which doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Um, it, it does when you're repairing the clock. So if you've got a, you know, the normal thing is the rack arm is bent or broken or something. And um, when you're calculating that value, anyway, I won't go into that because it's all on the video. But just interesting to note that these actually do share a common radius. The other thing I wanted to point out here is that sometimes, um, for whatever reason, this uh, component here on the rack hook gets filed or otherwise sort of um, mutilated. What it should be like, and of course there is no should, there is no proper way to repair clocks, is that this, let's move it a bit closer, there we go, this arc here should be struck as part of a circumference around the rack hook stud. So basically this is part of a circle. Now if this has got draw, so when the rack hook is being lifted by the warning piece here, what will happen is that the rack will be pushed against the rack spring. And if that rack spring is too strong, or if there's a lot of draw here, then um, the clock might stop. If otherwise this has been either worn, and in this case it's a bit worn, you can just about see a little bit of movement there. It's quite, it's quite good. There's not a lot of movement, but there's some. Sometimes this gets filed away or very worn. And what happens is when the rack's fully gathered, uh, let's say it's here, we know on this rack it's not quite there, but the action of the gathering pallet uh, coming to rest here against this stop pin um, disengages the rack. And sometimes on some hours, you'll find that the clock either strikes an extra one or it in fact continues to jump out and uh, continue striking. So a bit like the stop piece on a French clock on a pendule, this surface here should be part of a circumference. Uh, so equal radius to the rack stud, a uh, rack hook. So that's the second thing I wanted to mention. The third thing I wanted to mention was, uh, where's my picture? Was safety. Now, um, I don't want to uh, teach my grandmother to suck eggs, as they say, up in Yorkshire. Um, but this extra piece here on the uh, lifting piece is for safety. And what that means is if the owner or that person 
involved in there's that whole uh, poor old squeaking clock there's that whole sort of rule of thumb of always just move that down a little bit there we go of always putting the hands forward but if the owner or the whoever puts the hands backwards so normally you put the hands forward lifts the lifting piece the clock runs to warning and then at the hour uh, it drops, the, the lifting piece drops and the train runs. If you put the hands backwards, you can see here that you can press as hard as you like or within reason, and it's totally jammed. This pin here, the lifting pin, is totally jammed against the, uh, the safety piece. And so here's a question. The last clock I worked on like this was exactly the same. The uh, safety piece had been, well, I don't know. This is a question. There is no right or wrong way and of course the minute you say they're all like that then something comes along to um, prove you wrong but is it that the safety piece has never been bent round or is it that uh, somebody has seen it and not really maybe understood what it was about and bent it straight again i just find my pliers so how this should be Scare quotes, scare quotes, no should, is that, um, let me lift that up. If I got a hold of that there and bent it round to about 45 degrees, what would happen is as the hands are turned backwards, this pin rides, or the um, lifting piece rides up on the base of the pin and it doesn't break the hands. You can actually turn the hands backwards. So we might be able to tell whether it has ever been different from this by looking for scratch marks on the back of the lifting piece. So the question over to you people out there, because I see there are at least three people there. How many are there, Rachel? 16 people, yay! Well done, thank you for joining us um, on this uh, live stream. So the question is, it's the boat time, guys, and uh, is, do we leave this as it is with no safety, or do we, uh, bend it round so there is safety there. Um, given that the bit of metal is 200 years old and there's a small chance it'll break, I don't think it will. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, so that was the third thing, wasn't it? So it's vote time. Get on your... So it's leave it as it is. The clock will work absolutely fine, but there'll be no safety. Or um, do we bend it round? The other thing, of course, to look at is to see whether there's any safety on the snail. I'm pretty sure there will be, although the rack arm isn't that um, flexible. I guess it would ride up on the face of the snail if the striking fell, but that's a slightly different issue, different kind of safety. The fourth thing I was going to mention was, um, I don't know if you can, let's just, you can see in there. What's the question? About whether you should change it. So the, the question is the boat is either leave it or bend it. So you can put leave or bend. And I know we've already voted on the whole leave thing once, so that'll send us all into a terrible cold sweat. But anyway, different kind of leave. Uh, the question is, do we leave the lifting piece here as it is, so the clock's got no safety if you were to wind the hands backwards, or do we twist this round 45 degrees? So no filing, no hammering, no soldering, no um, scrubbing with an angle grinder. Just bend it round, is it just? And uh, then the clock's got safety. So if the person setting the hands sets them backwards past the point of the striking at the hour, uh, it won't break anything. Yeah, Jeremy, so, bend it. so we've got two for bend. Have we got any levers? Not so far. No levers yet. All right. Okay. So the fourth thing I want to talk about, and um, you know, it's going to be pretty tricky to see inside there, I'm afraid. Yeah, the says bend it but check for stress marks right so it looks like we're going for bending it then uh, and and uh chris good point have a look see if there are any stress fractures first before you go bending it so i want to just look at the i can just see there the pin that holds the slip washer on the back of the barrel now this is <laughs> one of those things that frankly is quite irritating People often cut those off flush with the slip washer, which is totally normally unnecessary. 
I leave them long so the next person can easily pull the pin out. However, there's one time when you do have to cut them pretty close to flush with the slip washer, and that's to do with the rack spring. If you leave the pin here long, you can just about see it sticking out there. If you leave that long and you get your clock running, put it on test, and then after about half an hour, it stops dead. Um, then I did this. Uh, <laughs> I did this a couple of months ago. What happens is that the pin uh, jams up against the rack spring here. Uh, sorry, it's not really in focus, but here there's actually quite a good gap between the rack spring and the slip washer on the great wheel. Sometimes they're really, really, really close. In fact, sometimes give an end shake, they can actually uh, touch. So I would say um, uh, leave them well, you've got about two millimetres here. Leave them long and the next person can pull the thing out. So I'm just going to put a bit of um, paraffin on this screw because we'll try and get that out later. Now, somewhere. So the brushes I use for these, this kind of thing where you want to sort of cheap and cheesy little brush. I use these, I think they're a horse hair. So apologies, uh, vegans uh, out there. Um, and they're, they're sold with flux brushes uh, and they're the kind of thing you can use. I usually don't try and just dispose of them, but um, they're useful for little jobs like this. So we're just going to dash on a little bit of um, paraffin there and allow that to soak in. All right, looks like we're going to try bending that uh, lifting piece then. So. Uh, we'll get that off next and um, just show you, just demonstrate what I mean by safety in case anybody out there hasn't seen this. So we'll leave that screw soaking. And then, gosh, amazingly, I don't know whether that's, um, I didn't look on the inside before, but amazingly that paraffin seems to already have come through the, Plate. I'm not sure, maybe it ran down here. Be a bit, a bit of a miracle if it had already come through the screw hole. It can't have done, can it? This looks like it did. Anyway, let's leave that for the time being. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is to get off this lifting piece. And I'll just show you that little twisty thing. So as it is, it jams if you turn the hands backwards, but let's just go around these uh, taper pins. A little bit of... Paraffin on there. I don't know. I know that on YouTube there are lots and lots and lots of tests about the efficacy, if there is such a word, of um, effectiveness of different penetrating oils. I just go across the road and buy paraffin because I use that for cleaning as well, or washing, or whatever we want to call it nowadays. Um, so it's nice and easy. I put a bit down there and a lovely little rack spring as well oh i forgot you must see the rack spring before we uh, repair it so that joyous little bit of um artwork down there because i know you like it so much um anyway now these uh pins um i'm not going to keep them i'm not going to you could keep them put them in a bit of card like we said before straighten them out get the rust off I'm not going to do that. Um, I may well get pilloried for it, but there you go. I'm going to take them out and I won't chuck them away, but I'll put them in a bag and give them back to the uh, client who kind of doesn't exist. Um, anyway, so let's just give that uh, paraffin a couple of minutes to work its way in there. Usually find. Sometimes if these things are um, really tightly stuck, you can put a bit of heat on as well. And I know a lot of people I read, or I used to read, put, are kind of very keen to get gas on things and heat it up. Um, I'm in a fortunate position of not really being in a rush. I can usually wait, I wait overnight or something. So I um, would prefer not to do that if I can, if I can help it. Oh, forgotten there. Tell us as well just in case we get that far, which would be good fun, wouldn't it? Yes, Matthew, that'd be great fun. 
Okay, so let's just have a look at this one and we can do that little uh, sort of repair thing. So we can, for getting the pins out, we could either use our slotted pliers, which are notched pliers, should I say. So it's got a little notch on one side and push it out. I've got a feeling that this pin is not gonna come out that easily, but um, let's not. I don't wanna bend it over and I don't wanna break it off. Oh, well, there you go. That's good. So I'll find some tweezers and a bag. We do already have a bag, don't we, with a lot of bits in that we've uh, taken up already, like the gut lines and things. But anyway, so let's just put that in there. So that was um, a remarkably pain-free start. I think it's probably <laughs> time to go home now. We'll, we'll leave it there, but that was good. So bearing in mind that this clock has been um, sat, uh, sat uh, I don't know what it's been. It's about 40 years, I think, since it was... Uh, it came from its present location. So you can, when lifting these suds off, it's worth, this might just be rust, but it's worth looking uh, or feeling how they um, lift off. Because that on very rare occasions causes a problem. What you tend to find is either a bit of a burr on the end where the pin's been pushed in, or there has been uh, somebody, you know, getting end cutters on it or something. But normally what happens, is that uh, so there we are so this is really nice work it's um like it look at this file file marks uh, underneath really nice flat work and it appears that the a warning piece look is not nicer again all these scare quotes today nicer on on the visible side than it was, is underneath. So somebody spent just that little bit more time uh, to finish it where it would kind of um, be seen more often. That's interesting. So the question is, hmm. so I don't see any a kind of scratch marks there where that pin has, um, has rubbed round on the inside. And of course, <laughs> I don't see that. Anyway, the first time that we were to bend this, and this is me getting on my soapbox, of course, and then it gets scratched by that pin, then that's it. It's done and cannot be undone, as they say. So with, um, let's just have a look along its length. It's not exactly straight, so I might straighten it up a little bit anyway. Um, yeah, there's a bending it that bend in it there. Look, now if that's fractionally shortened, of course, what it's going to mean is that, and it would only be fractional, wouldn't it? But let's say it's fractionally shortened, that would mean that the clock would strike early, a little bit early, wouldn't it? So, I'm going to try and straighten that and straighten that, and then we're going to twist it round and uh, see how it goes. In the meantime, on this stud, what I was talking about before is often I'm going to probably use the uh, dreaded adjustable spanner to uh, get these studs out. You could use, could make a brass spanner, of course, but last time I did that, it nearly killed me. And, um, and it killed me and sent me to uh, closer to bankruptcy at the same time. Uh, or you could use parallel jawed pliers. I've seen somebody out there has got those parallel jawed pliers. Is it Ian? Um, is Ian there tonight? Yeah. Ian, is it you that's got the parallel jaw pliers? The jeweler ones with the brass jaws are really nice. 
And I really wish I had a pair right now for getting these studs out, but I don't. I might actually, because we don't need the studs out to take the clock apart. What I might do is to get a pair of those on order from Walsh's or um, Cookson's or something like that, because I think they're quite nice and uh, I shouldn't really use them just to go on them, should I? But it, what happens is tempting to get your end cutters on there and uh, of course this gets damaged, the stud, and then the component can just hang up. And again, it's one of those gotcha situations because you put it on, you think, oh, it was a little bit tight. And then you think, but it'll be fine. It won't be fine. Um, if that's happened, this is actually one of the few places that I would use. Um, yeah, and it looks like it has there. Uh, we can, how close we can get to focusing. There's some damage there to the stud, um, which is um, can be problematic. So this is a, a point where I actually might use a pivot file burnisher. You thought I would never ever say it, you hear me say it, but the burnishing end of a pivot file just to shove that damage down again. You don't even have to really use it in the lathe. You can just kind of push it down, push the metal. Uh, it's soft, so it deforms quite easily. Right. Okay. I don't know where my um, biggest pair of cutters are, but I was going to get this stood, stood out of here. Joke. Um, right, okay. So let's um, straighten this up a bit. Let's just get a hammer. Taking bets on you being able to extract those, all of those pins just like that. Yeah, they really want that money. It was, it felt like that. It felt like the, uh, the hand of God on me. Right, okay. So I think um, we'll go for the boxwood hammer on this one. You know I'm a great fan of the rawhide, but I don't think it'll be quite strong enough to straighten out that bit of brass. So I'm going to go for the boxwood. Uh, it's a uh, nice thing i think i got it from yeah it was from if any of you were down in sussex you will know lee side tools which i think used to be called yapton tools is that the same place don't even know whether it's still going or not but when we were students back in the day when i had hair um we used to go down there in the minibus and uh, no doubt make people's life misery down there but got some quite nice things that i've still got today uh, so this is quite nice with an ash handle and a boxwood head. I know how we like our tools. So I think that's a good tool to try and straighten this. And I now need my bench block, which uh, isn't in the place it should be. So just uh, bear with me while I have a look around for it. How's everybody doing, Mitch? All good, yeah. Yeah, all good. Good. They all got a scotch somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> So I could put a bit of um, paper between the um, the brass and the bench block just to prevent it marking. In fact, I will do. Because I'm trying to be trying to be good. Of course, you could just get a pair of pliers and bend it straight, which is what most um, people would do quite rightly. Because what I'm trying to do here is to um, preserve these paint splats. We talked about this last week. I'm really keen that we lose as few of those as possible. So that was um, alarmingly straightforward. Straightening it up. 
I could uh, do a bit more, I suppose, because it was the second thing tonight that seemed too easy. So <laughs> I don't know what that means. Anybody know whether Yaps and Tools is still trading or not? Y-A-P-T-O-N. I think it's called Lee Side Tools, actually. Right. So you can see by straightening this, it's actually made it move out a little bit. So it doesn't, um, doesn't work at all now. So we just need to encourage that back into place. Oh, All right, yeah. Lee side tools. Yeah, side tools, yeah. Oh, nice. Now, if you want to make, um, what we want to do now is we want to uh, make the brass just curl up ever so slightly, because now we've straightened it, it's no longer been lifted by the pin. So if you um, hammer it on a slightly compliant surface, it'll just begin to curve a bit. So for that very purpose, We've got little bits of um, lino, which were left over from the um, left over from the bench top. And you can see there, just curved it around. The metal is actually surprisingly kind of um, malleable. Yeah. And he puts them in a soft jaw vice. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Where the bend is. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. So he uses a vice to just kind of cut. I mean, I think the thing about this is without going off on a rant, it's about the kind of most reasonably controlled way you can do it. Because with the whole project, with everything, we kind of have a, a place, it's slightly nebulous at the moment, but where we want to end up. And you all know where your place is. And as we've said many times, our places are all pretty different. However, you establish that place and that place isn't fixed. You kind of move around and it's the same thing for something like um, a cell fire lamp going off. My daughter cooking. Um, it's not. Won't be long. And um, so uh, we, uh, the same thing with straightening something or whatever your process is, in your mind, you have a place-ish where you want that thing to get to. And, um, you know, that changes as you go along and of course as your practice develops and so on. And um, so I think, that my point is rather labored point is that we approach that point uh, the best way we can and in a kind of gradual way because if you just have some unilateral way of doing something then the chances are you kind of overshoot that point and do more which wastes time and obviously changes the object anyway so we've got to the stage now where the arm is straightened up a little bit and uh, it's working as it was but the safety doesn't work. So we're just gonna bend it round, twist it along its axis. Like that, yeah. And let's see if it works. When you adjust these lifting pieces, what you've got to be careful of is 
make sure that with end shake with both components at their maximum end shake uh, this doesn't touch on here because what can happen is the clock can run to warning but then it doesn't drop so it doesn't strike or what happens is it maybe drops at a n other time um, and again you get a complaint so working by now lifting 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 dropping off and there's our safety so there we go so apologies to those people that said leave it you were outvoted and uh hope all you people who said twist it or bend it are happy uh there we go and there's our little mark look on the back that we just made so um even in this what i would like to think but maybe uh wrong is a relatively conservative sort of approach to clock uh treatment you know you still doesn't matter how careful you are you make marks you can't help it and of course the most powerful thing in terms of changing an object is thinking about it so you don't even have to take it apart just thinking about it uh changes it uh but anyway let's not <laughs> get onto those philosophies. So what I'm going to do now is um, this is our first component off. And you can see actually just handling uh, the rust is really insignificant. This is going to clean up beautifully. Uh, I will try and get a little bit of this off. But once it's uh, been in paraffin for a good old scrub and a little bit of steel wool, maybe four zero steel wool, this is going to be absolutely fine. Again, just to um, climb on the soapbox again, uh, just only just climbed off it a few minutes ago, is that what we're, what we, what I'm interested in is in so-called cleaning is differentiating between working and non-working surfaces. So in this component, which is typical, you have got three, he says, or oh, four working surfaces. Okay. So you've got the bearing for the stud. You've got the lifting piece here, including our new safety action. You've got the bit where it lifts the rack hook, which is there. So just on the end of that component, you can see the little witness mark there. And uh, you've got the inside of the warning flag where the warning pin rests uh, after warning. So they're the bits that particularly interest me. The rest of it, I'm not bothered, as long as it's not, as we always say, causing a problem for itself, as in some kind of rapid deterioration, instability, or it's going to cause a problem for your uh, owner or winder or members of the public, something that's going to break and in cause personal injury, uh, which I don't think this is. This component's in really good nick. So other than a little bit of cleaning of these working surfaces, I'm happy and done with that. So I'm going to put, find a tray, put on a tray and carry on with the paper pins. I want um I'll do all the cleaning uh, in one go otherwise we're in and out with the um with the uh uh fume extractor thing so that goes in the tray And on to the next thing. So um, oh, I should have done a vote what to take off next. Well, as we've taken off the um, the, the uh, lifting piece and warning piece, let's now move on to, let's get the rack off because that's kind of in the way as well. So now this is, uh, let's say it's, I'll have to uh, go back to the previous owner of the clock and find out how long it is since it's been apart, but I, 38 years or something like that, I seem to remember, but anyway. I don't normally use the notch pliers that much, but they are kind of quite nice in terms of control. There we are. Second one out. That's nice. Well, let's just think about this um, component. We know we agreed uh, by some form of <laughs> uh, democracy 
Also, when you're taking these things off the studs, just check that the studs are perpendicular to the plate. For whatever reason, often they get bent, which doesn't necessarily mean they need bending back, but it's just something to put in your day book. So uh, here's the rack, rack tail, rack arm, pin under there, and you'll be able to see that the pin is angled um, for, again, it, it, sorry if you're familiar with these clocks, but if you're not familiar with these clocks, then that uh, angle on there is again the second sort of element of safety on this clock and that is for the hour wheel if I can find it So here's our um, our wheel uh, and snail, and you can see on the leading edge, a radial face of the snail here, the step between one and 12, the component is angled. And what this is for, let's just get this right, um, our wheel rotates like this. And if for any reason the striking fails to operate, uh, or it hasn't been wound, for instance, but the going side has, then uh, as the snail comes round, these two angled surfaces uh, touch one another and the rack arm rides up on the snail. And some clocks you repay, you can see here, look, where that's happened. Uh, get my pointy stick. See that line there? That's what that is. So at some point, um, this clock's been running and the striking either hasn't been working or it hasn't been uh, wound, which is quite cool. Anyway. So that's all in order, nothing loose here. Good to go, I think. All the teeth look reasonably uh, straight and, oh, reasonably. Actually, they're not that straight, but um, there's a couple bent here at the end, look. But I'm not gonna bother straightening those yet until we've gone through our preliminary cleaning. So I'm gonna do the cleaning in two stages. I'm gonna basically give it a once over, get rid of some of the surface, loose surface growth, clean up the bearings, then do the repairs when it's a bit more handleable. Um, and then if there's anything else uh, that needs another bit of cleaning. So yeah, you can see here, we've got um, a rat tooth there that's a little bit bent and a rat tooth here that's a little bit bent. So that could be a sign of a depthing issue. But if you remember back to our gathering palette from last week, that is in a real mess. So maybe those two things are connected, the kind of fractured gathering palette are worn and these damaged rack teeth, but uh, that's not a big problem. They'll straighten up quite easily, I think. Otherwise, yeah, look for fractures across here. Often get that if the thing's been uh, bent. But again, we've got some beautiful texture there, really nice. A Little bit of light surface rusting, but nothing for me to get uh, worried about. Yeah, often these, this is just a uniform piece of material. Often they're filed away at the back to kind of a triangular section, um, which ends down here. And that gives the thing a lot more flexibility for that safety action that we talked about. Um, it's a little bit bent. I think that'll just bend back quite easily. Not too bothered about that at the moment. So, you know, the, um, the score now, um, if you haven't gone to sleep, I wandered off to the pub, then uh, we will press on. It's really nice, I mean, I'm speaking too soon, obviously, but really nice to see these pins that haven't been driven like crazy into their holes. Uh, it's just not necessary to do that on center arbors, French clocks, um, and particularly uh, rack posts. You often see the end of the stud split up and sometimes it's been hard soldered, sometimes it's just left with a crack, sometimes it breaks off altogether. It's not necessary to drive those pins in like crazy. The key to the pins not dropping out, and yeah, it's a pain if you repair a clock, you put it in your van, and you take it to be delivered and the pin drops out, the secret to them not dropping out is to draw file them. So to file them with a sharp file along the lens before you put them in. And that just helps them grip in there and they don't drop out. 
So again, getting this component off, you can feel that it's really tight. Now that would normally kind of, um, as I said before, worry me, but actually here, I just think it's the rust. I don't think it's anything more, um, we'll just have a look actually through an eyeglass, but I don't think it's anything You know, particularly more worrying than that. Sometimes they're split or cracked or something. So I'll just keep putting the paraffin on that. I might try and just uh, scrub a bit of that rust off because I don't want to really force the um, component past that rusty bit. But otherwise, it'll mark the inside of the bore of the component. So, oh, there we are. Just a little bit of wiggling. Um, they were good. All good. Uh, as I said, this area here, let me just have a look. Yeah, you can see it's a bit worn. So it's kind of um, what you would call legitimate wear. We'll make a note of that and keep an eye on it. Um, you have got a bit of a problem there, not a problem, but if this is bad, it's very much uh, analogous to rebasing pallets. What, oh, I, I won't get to it. Uh, <laughs> excited again about polishing out the wear. Don't polish out the wear, because if you polish out the wear and whatever that means, um, what, what will happen, of course, is that the rack will be in the wrong place uh, when you put it back together. And so it might make you feel better that it looks better, um, but one step forward, one step back with this, isn't it? If you imagine that this surface here is um, say you were to file out and polish up that wear with one of those, whatever they call them, uh, polishing paper stuff. The rack is going to be, let's get this right, further this way when it's uh, indexed by the rack hook. So that means that the uh, gathering pallet uh, gathering piece is going to be more at a butting angle. So rather than gathering like this, it's going to be more and more and more like that, the more the rack moves around. So I suppose the question is, what do you do with that if it wears to the degree that, in fact, it's not gathering properly? Well, I would say again, I mean, the answer probably is some kind of filling of that wear or refacing, because you want to maintain this radius. That's really important here. So I, I imagine what you would do is to reface that. And what that's going to do is it's actually going to, when the gathering part gathers, it tends to gather across the center. So it starts off like this, it gathers, and then the, what happens then? And then the rack hook drops back in the next two and it gathers up. So I would prefer that angle to be more like this, um, but of course you still need the striking to function. So that is quite a tricky little problem. And you see this time and time and time again, that people get to this point and understandably they start either filing something or bending something. And then they think, ah, blast, it doesn't work now. I'll start bending the rack arm or I'll bend this up, I'll bend it down. Do not bend, file, polish out the wear, that kind of thing, unless you absolutely have to do. Mm, it's exciting. Right, okay, let's get the uh, minute wheel off. Now you can see with getting these components off and this bit of paraffin that we we're putting on the frame. Ah, uh, that's interesting, look. Do you remember last week or the week before? We asked, um, didn't we, whether there'd ever been a 24 hour wheel and stood and it looks like there has. See there? See the mark where the stud's been screwed into the frame. Therefore, that tells me, I think that this movement and this style haven't always been together, they're associated. Uh, which is cool, um, no problem with that, but it's just an interesting thing to, um, interesting using the term loosely to note. Yeah, good question from uh, Wolfie, from Chris, about laser welding. I, it may, um, there's a mass of that technology in industry. And it's the same old question, I'm afraid. I really wish horology, the um, professional institutions mentioning no names, 
would invest in that kind of research and hook up with universities who are doing this kind of work because I know with laser welding it's not just as simple as infilling the space and then grinding it away because there are all sorts of um, different hardnesses of filler material and I'll, presumably I haven't thought about it that much but you want a hard a hardness of filler material that's similar to the host component and there are also boundary issues where you have um, yeah, a, a boundary hardness or work hardening or something. So I'm great fan of the idea of filling in with something. And you could probably fill in with something like sintered epoxy. I know one of the respected turret clock people sometimes fill in the pinion leaves, I think, with sintered epoxy. Sounds like a great idea to me. Um, if you reface with a bit of hardened uh, mainspring or something, watch mainspring, that's how I would do it now, but I certainly think like all these things like cleaning, like oiling, the whole nine yards, that that would be really great. There was a chap, oh gosh, uh, he's no longer with us, called Peter Powell, I think, who did some research on laser filling. And I've seen it done actually quite successfully, uh, but I've never had it done myself and um, it really needs some research. So. Again, if one of those professional institutions could hook up with the university uh, engineering department and dive into that, that would be really cool. Okay, so yeah, um, weld it, reface it. Of course, you could braze it, couldn't you? You could you could run a braze or silver solder, which is a little bit lower temperature, into that and then file it down. Now, personally, that's uh brass engaging with steel then isn't it i wouldn't have a big problem with that again i think the well it isn't an answer at all it's the opposite of an answer i think uh, the point here is that there's discussion there's dialogue there's no proper way to fix a clock and in a what's really important is that we keep their tone positive and um of course it's you know i'm sort of uh you know administering this thing um so it probably seems a bit disingenuous to say that we're all kind of in it together uh but i think collectively the wider thing with the institutions in particular the training institutions and the three professional institutions that i can think of or four maybe in this country but there's a positive approach to um discussing uh this stuff and developing and publishing your work in an open way and the problem with that is you just have to constantly sort of um, eat humble pie and say, well, actually, in that case, uh, I was, um, uh, I see there's a better way of doing it or a different way of doing it. So go for it, go for it, go for it. Right, I'm going to get the um, minute wheel off now. Right, interestingly, um, if these things ever are interesting, that the pin has been put in, if you can see there the so-called wrong way round. Um, it's not the wrong way round, it's just that if I were doing it, I think I would get gravity on my side, again, for that idea of the pin falling out. There's maybe a reason for that, if I'm sure there's a reason for that. Um, probably the hour wheel was here, so it's not so easy to put the pin in from the hour wheel side, but I would. So if the pin does tend to work loose, then at least gravity is kind of trying to hold it in the hole. Not a big deal, but just a, an observation. Just out of interest, I know this is taking a long time, so that's the obvious difference between um, how you would do it and how we're doing it here. But are there any kind of, um, you know, major differences and sort of top tips to come back in this direction or to share with the group, which you're probably doing, but I can't see, about how you would approach this, um, this uh, disassembly? Oh, poor old rack spring. I'm really loving that rack spring. And again, 
This is a little bit rusty, so I'll just give that a few minutes. So I think the next thing to come off, because I don't have my flat nose dual appliers yet, um, which I'm going to leave those in place. The next thing is to get this uh, hour bridge off, which is interesting, of course, because we uh, know that it needs a repair on the hour pipe. So it'll be the first time to see that. So what I'm interested in, in what, what I'm interested in here is the difference in diameter between the inside of this pipe and the outside of this boss on the cannon wheel. Because if there is a significant difference, that might help us in somehow making a sleeve that's going to support the repaired hour pipe. Um, but anyway, so um, just to, again, many of you will have worked on this type of clock. But if you haven't, then these things are often marked. So sometimes they have taper pins, one here and one here, and you can't put it on the wrong way around. But often they don't have taper pins. This one doesn't appear to have taper pins. So you could put it on upside down and they're not symmetrical, so they're not reversible. So the maker has dot marked the frame here. And again, this is a big difference between the maker dot marking it and a repairer or a conservator dot marking it. My view is don't do it. It's really, really, really rare that you need to mark any component. Yes, it ostensibly makes the whole reassembly process uh, different, but I would be uneasy about actively sort of putting marks on things. As you've seen already, we're already putting loads of marks on it anyway. Uh, it's kind of like scratches and scrapes everywhere. So I really don't want to kind of actively do that if I can help it. Sometimes I use a pencil and put a little pencil mark on if you're looking for, like we've got the rogue tooth coming up in um, Open Clock Club on a Saturday, might use a pencil there, but not a Sharpie or something because uh, the Sharpie will inevitably leave a mark and you've got to try and get it off and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, stop going on screwdriver time. Okay, Rich. Okay, well, Wolfie's going to um, try and the lottery so he can fund the research project. Great. Well, just need the numbers. That's. Uh, good and what i would say in slightly pointedly is that we do already have um some professional institutions some of whom are very wealthy who i think should be funding those things but um they go. they're not yet Nice screwdriver, but doesn't really fit. So called not so nice screwdriver fits really well, but it's a bit narrow. Problem here is you don't really have enough screwdrivers. <laughs> Team Open Clock Clubs laughing. Now here's a real horror that's being used to <laughs> stir paint. Not by me, honest. Not by me, but it um, is a reasonable fit. I've already, um, as you can see at the end there, filed it down. So look at that, gosh. Well, I don't know what to make of that. Um, try to find one that, um, Oh, that's all right. A little bit more palatable. This is a kind of turn screw one uh, that is marked 1940 something. And it's got the um, broad arrow on there, look, for the WD. So probably somebody nicked it from the government, government property. Don't really like these turn screw tile style screwdrivers. Somebody scrubbed this, unfortunately, with wet and dry paper. Um, but uh, anyway, it happens to fit. So stop going on and actually get the screws and done. I'm just gonna tap these down. So the screwdriver and the screw are kind of mated together with my boxwood hammer. Mallet. Uh, 
can't see this but um, difficult to film and great all that chunk. Now, in terms of, we, you might remember right back when we talked about putting these screws in bits of card and things, I think, which is absolutely fine if we're doing a more complicated uh, clock. Those burrs, by the way, are not me um, on the screws, honest, um, as you've just seen then. Uh, I might tap those burrs down like we do with the barrel lab. I'll do that today, just to um, sort of push some of them back into place. Uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, I'm not bothered about putting the screws in the right place or keeping them in the right place. I think this clock is old enough and it's been taken apart enough times to presume that we just need to look at them all again. There aren't that many. There are only, what, 10 screws in the whole clock or something. Um, so I'll just look at them, match them up and uh, presume they're kind of going in the right place again. So yeah, few burrs on there. Um, personally and um, rather predictably, what I don't like is uh, filing these screws or polishing them. You know, they weren't polished when they were new. And yeah, you see somebody's taking it out with a pair of end cutters, like I was trying to do before. Oh, well, there you go. That's fine. I'm, I can live with that. But what I will do is just tap these uh, burrs down a little bit. Actually, I could leave them. Maybe I'll leave them. Oh. Can't get my screwdriver in. Camera. Oh, this is really nice. So underneath the um, hour wheel bridge, you can see there that um, it's been a long time since this has been off. So it looks nice. Very slight burrs on those threads, but I don't think that's because they've been retapped. I just think it's as the screws have been tightened up, I think. And then under the uh, hour wheel bridge, nice there. Little bit of a Oh no, that's fine. That's nice and flat. So despite the pipe being broken off, that's actually in really good nick. Super pleased with that. Um, but what we're going to say was, we're going to look at the difference, weren't we, in diameter. Let's just put that there. Of course, I can measure this, but let's just have a, an eyeball. Oh, there's a lot. So there's um, a country mile of gap there. So I think if we are careful, um, we can turn a little sleeve that goes on the inside uh, that will support the repair to the hour pipe. Um, but again, please, in the live chat, how would you do it? Um, ideally, and I don't have that facility at the moment, I'd put a bit of wood in the lathe, like a, just a chunk of boxwood or something, turn it down so it was this profile, with a spigot that came out the middle, then I would be able to feed on the hour pipe and then I would soft solder it in place. Then maybe make a supporting ring. Remember the hour wheel goes against there. So we can't have too much of a fillet of material in the corner between the two. It's gotta be quite clean still. Um, so something on the inside might, might help. I'll just try and find the pipe. Uh, how would you do that? How would you repair um, that thing? Our pipe. Our pipe. Has everybody gone home? Yeah. Oh, yay. Great. Oh, so lovely to. Uh, hear are all the regulars there in the live chat. Thank you for supporting. Slightly crazy um, escapade. Because this is a casting, it 
appears to have broken reasonably cleanly. Saying that, will it fit back together again? Hmm. So it's like a very large thread. Oh, there we go. Cool. Right. Well, the good news is that it goes back together. Sorry, I couldn't do that on the camera because I couldn't see. But it goes back together incredibly neatly. And I thought, gosh, why is this broken off? Um, I think the problem with it is it's not going to be straight. It, um, I'll try uh, hold it together. Um, why is it broken off so e relatively easily? Of course, it's very thin because what they've done, the maker, quite rightly, is they've gotten the graver in here to clear out this corner to make sure that there's um, the dirt or swarf or whatever can't get in there between the back of the hour wheel pipe so um, to make the bearing work really well, but that has left it quite weak and it snapped off when the clock has been dropped or something. So the question is, is it gonna be straight if we just solder it back on? And that's really where a little um, sort of former turned on the lathe would really help. Anyway, I'm not meant to be doing this today, so. As always, easily distracted. So you could actually um, fill some of that cutaway with soft solder. Um, and if that was cleaned up and there was some so a little bit of solder on the inside, a little bit of solder on the outside, I mean, this thing just supports the hour wheel and the um, our hand. So I suspect it would be strong enough. I'm definitely not going to silver solder it because that's just too much sort of heat. Anyway, I won't mess about. What I'll do for next week is I'll make up a little bit of them. Um, oh, there we are. Hmm. It's um. I think it'll go back together. Okay. The question is, once it's mounted back on there, is it going to be straight, or are we going to have to make some kind of little jig or something to hold it, uh, hold it straight? But uh, yeah, that's nice. That's nice to see that. Um, as I was saying, it's got this dot mark on here, and you can see that it's no burrs on it. It's been put there with the maker. Somebody um mentioned your names. I, I once had a bit of a run in about. Uh, our bridges and back cocks that don't have steady pins and I love a back cock that doesn't have a steady pin because of course you've got a little bit of slop there to adjust external drop on this kind of escapement and um, this other person said oh no you should always drill them because it's going to move and I thought it's going to move it's going to move where where's it going to move because it doesn't well in my view it doesn't move uh, okay cool Let's just tap these burrs down and that's done and out of the way. Could you soft solder a narrow but wider pipe and then broach it out? Sorry, you meant thicker, not wider. Soft solder a thicker pipe. Yeah. I, I think, um, Jeremy, that's kind of what I would do ideally, is that if that's what you mean to make, I'm definitely, you know, keeping this bit and keeping this bit, nothing wrong with those, but certainly to put another pipe on the inside and then broach it so it's um, thin. I think exactly that's the right thing to do. And of course, this is broached taper already. Uh, so to put it just a supporting piece on the inside. The problem is we don't have much space here on the... Often the uh, 
just get the cannon wheel off. Often the cannon wheel comes very close to the inside of the bridge like that. And in fact, if your um, boat or bow friction springs too strong and you don't put a, uh, a, a pin in the center, often this can touch on the inside and cause the clock to stop. So we don't have much space there, but we've certainly got space inside there. So yeah, I would put a solder a pipe inside there. And then as you said, if that's what you meant, brush it, brush it out. Um, let's just put that back in place. And let's deal with these. So obviously being slightly hypocritical because these burrs aren't doing any harm there. They're absolutely fine. They're, they're not loose. They're not gonna fall into the mechanism. Um, but I am just gonna, for demonstration, I suppose, tap them down to get my trusty split stake like this. Maybe actually that one will do. Hold it in the vise, gloves leaking. And a little hammer. Let's breathe, somebody smooth. I actually don't need to put it in the vise. It's always tricky when you begin, when one <laughs> begins to kind of conjecture what somebody might do in the future. We don't know, I don't know, and to a degree, I don't care, that's out of my control. But what I would say, uh, contradicting myself, is that by doing this, you know, maybe I will prevent somebody from seeing those burrs, putting it in the lathe, getting a file and refinishing the whole screw, like a kind of gramophone, uh, record. So that's all I'm going to do is just tap them down like that, exactly like we did on the barrel arbor, um, and leave it. And I don't know whether that neatens it up or not. I don't know if you can see here, maybe camera can't focus in, but these are V-shaped slots on these screws. You can see they're just about uh, so they're not parallel sided slots like a sort of 20th century clock. Anyway. Good. Done that, done that, done that, done that. Now we're doing the time. Hmm. Right, okay. So let's just continue with our motion work. And on to the next thing that causes loads and loads and loads and loads of problems. And that is the bow or boat spring. I never know what the uh, name for it is. Um, it's either B or W. It's a friction spring, basically, between the going of the clock and the hands of boat, B-O-A-T. So do you call it the bow spring, like the bow because it's bow shaped, or boat because it's boat shaped as well? What, um, oh, I forgot the name of the person that wrote the clock book, uh, one of the earliest clock books where he describes the name of the parts. Um, somebody will know. What, one of you people will know who, that, who I'm thinking of. Um, I might remember, but you'll get you'll get there first. Um, I wonder what they call it. 16th century clock book where they describe the name of the parts, English, come on, brain. Anyway, so motion work off. I've already got the minute wheel off. Cannon wheel, sorry. So there's our cannon wheel. Nice. Not been mutilated. Um, probably has a mark here. Let's just check for that mark where the uh, minute hand goes. I'll get a brush. Well, there's a brush. No, 16th century or 17th century. 17th century is probably. Um, come brain. Oh, nice. Um, Sorry, you probably can't see. 
but um, really, it'll come to me. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure one of you knows about it. Can't see. Ah, that's annoying. Anyway, can't see, need a better camera. Um, there's a mark by the maker struck across here with a file or a saw or something to show where the minute hand went. Now that's really important because obviously the relationship between the cannon wheel and the minute wheel can be one of four positions, but it was only made in one position. So if you're trying to kind of get back to some conjectured place of how it was made, um, so look, we've got, let's see if we've got any marks on here. Actually, very few. Often there are three or four. There's maybe one there. And maybe one there. Although I don't know whether that's, I mean, that's a mark that somebody's put on, but that's an accident or it's actually indicating that tooth. Let's see if there's something similar on the uh, minute wheel. Or oh, maybe there's a mark. Oh, it's marked there as well. So it looks to have been marked twice. Sometimes they're marked absolutely loads of times. Um, so that's often the case. Either this is struck across or there's a little file mark on here made when the clock was made. So that's your position where the hand would have gone. Um, so yeah, let's talk about bow springs, my favorite subject ever. Um, Often these things are replaced and often they're far, far, far too strong when they're replaced. Ideally, I don't know whether this is a replacement or not, it probably is, um, but I don't know. Um, the question is, does it do its job? And it will do its job, but it's also incredibly strong. For this spring to function well, and I'm not gonna change it, obviously, if it works as it is, but for this spring to function well, it needs to be tapered in both directions. So it needs to be um, needs, no such thing as needs, of course. Oh, what's the name of that clock book? Come on, brain. So if you're making the spring, let's say the spring's cracked or it's like so strong that it's crazy to get the, the pin in, um, the spring would normally be shaped like this. Something like that. So it's tapered along its length, but importantly, it's also tapered in thickness as well. So it's compliant. What you normally get with a spring like this that's uniform in thickness and uniform in width is of course it only bends across here so they tend to either buckle down and these parts touch on the frame or they crack across the center. So if you get to the position where you're making a new friction spring, then if you make it that shape and taper it as well, they work really well. And if the cannon wheel hasn't got enough stability, then sometimes they're very worn. You can make a three cornered spring, like a tricorn. Um, but, you know, I've kind of got nothing against that spring, so I'm going to leave it as it is. Uh, it's worth, yeah, looking on the back of the um, really nicely patinated this clock. It's going to look gorgeous when it's finished. Um, anyway, so it's worth looking on the back. Sometimes the uh, center has got a square on it and a square hole in here, which is good, which is fine. It's just how it is. But the spring has got to be particularly compliant then, because if you think about it like this, I'm sure you have all thought about it, the spring is uh, doesn't rotate in relation to the cannon wheel. It rotates in relation to the other. So this bit never moves, always moves here, um, which is fine because you've got a small radius. But if you've got a square here, it only ever rotates on the outside. So two things there. One is that uh, you lubricate the tips of the spring where it touches on the back of the cannon wheel. Otherwise, when you turn the hands, it makes this really grim brass on brass kind of screeching sound. Um, and two, the spring has got to be really compliant. Otherwise, 
uh, you've got to really force the hand round because the turning moment is it is a much larger radius. So the turning is a much larger radius. Anyway, don't think even I can talk about a boat spring much more or a cannon wheel. So let's have a look at our minute wheel, which. Just, I'm going to get a scalpel and just um, pick off a little bit of that uh, rust. Rust my brush. Nobody come up with the name of that book yet. Nearly, it's nearly, it's moved, slowly moving its way to the front of my brain. Yeah, it was right in the back. I haven't thought about it for 20 years, but it's slowly kind of creeping forward. Um, I keep wanting to say Rawlings, but I, I'm um, got Rawlings in the brain at the moment. I oh, will, I don't know whether you can see here, just about if I lift it up a little bit, but you can see maybe the reason the, uh, minute wheel isn't coming off is because it looks like the stud has been strained. The drill, the hole, is slightly off center, and it looks like when the pin's been pushed in, um, it's pushed it to one side. So it maybe isn't rust, it's maybe actually sort of mechanical. Dearham. Yeah. Is it -E I can't remember. Dearham on clock making. Blimey. Took me a long time to get that. Uh, anyway, um, I wonder what he calls whatever it was that we were talking about. Oh, the friction spring. <laughs> uh, things we have to do for entertainment. <laughs> what? Yeah, when the pubs are shut. Yeah, there we go. Right, yeah, so um, there's a problem. There is actually some damage on this stud. It's not uh, rust, as you can see. The stud is uh, bent over at the end. It's a bit rusty as well. Okay, so before we go any further, let's um, have a look at this and see what marks have been put on here. William Deerham, was it? Can't remember. Hopefully everybody's going on Amazon now and ordering a copy. I think the original copies are a fortune, but you can get um, kind of photocopies. Yeah, not a lot to say about this other than it's in really good nick. Um, the pin hasn't been replaced. The riveting's neat. The teeth haven't been broken off. Uh, the pinion... With this being a brass pinion, they often get quite worn. Yeah, it's... Um, mm, yeah, it is It is quite worn, the pinion, if you can see. I'll put some pictures on uh, Instagram. Now, the problem with this is this doesn't do a massive amount of work because it's only driving the hour wheel, which has only got the hour hand on it. And this did used to have uh, that 24-hour work thing, we think. So maybe, did it have more work to Yeah, it would have had more work to do. It's got to change the date as well. Um, but this is probably all right. But like everything to do with uh, depthing, our good old depthing and bushing thing, is that when that pinion wears, the pinion's only got six leaves on it, which was my obsession the other night in Open Clock Club. Why didn't they split the, um, why didn't they split the ratios more? sensibly um and so it's got six leaves on it and it's brass the other one's got 72 on it so presumably it wears uh 12 times less on the wheel but the problem with that is it's the pitch circle diameter of the pinion that's critical and once that wears past the outside diameter then you're going to have a problem with uh butting so again it's a bit like our gathering palette before uh as the of the leaf of the pinion and the tooth of the wheel in this case 
come together on their pitch circle diameters. Normally they're reasonably close to the center line between the two. If they start moving outside the pitch circle diameter, then they start engaging before the center line and butting occurs. So this is engaging friction. Um, now, sometimes you see people get round that by, and of course you've got other things wearing, you've got the hour pipe wearing on the inside of the um, hour bridge pipe. And so what you'll sometimes find is that the stud, the minute wheel stud gets bent across, which of course is never satisfactory uh, to getting um, the thing back uh, to a good engagement again. But luckily, and in fact, that is sometimes a reason why calendar work and moon work is taken off or disengaged because the clock jams at that point. So somebody says, well, we won't bother with that. We'll just take the work off and we don't have to worry about this uh, depth thing issue. But anyway, we'll, we'll look at that when we get to our next, um, after we've done our preliminary cleaning. So very happy with the uh, motion work. Ian, Ian found it. It's William Demon. All right, okay. Uh, late 17th century. Late 17th century. So I remember um, a good old um, <laughs> discussion stroke argument with students about what things are called. And of course, they're called um, living with a linguist. They're called what you want to call them. <laughs> uh, smiling. Um, uh, but it's just quite cool to see what things used to be called. Uh, the, the escape wheel used to be called the swing wheel and the on a 30 hour clock where you've got the 12 lifting pieces. I think Deerham calls them the fangs or the ratch or something. But I love the idea of them being called fangs. But anyway, uh, we don't know what he calls the boat spring or the bow spring, but it will be written down somewhere. So special prize for anybody who can find that. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, of course, the minute hour is bent on this, isn't it? Oh. Oh, here. I think that's pretty easy to straighten up. I'll just, again, it's brooch taper, but we'll just get a bit of brass pipe on there and straighten it back. And that's going to be dead easy. But we'll do that after our preliminary, oops, preliminary cleaning as well. So all good. So far, no horrors. We've still got the, uh, the rack spring. Are you still sure you want to do something about that? The more I look at it, the more I'm really, really getting to like it. Okay, so uh, let's get the frame apart because before we call it a day, we want to just have a look at that extended pivot, don't we? And see, was it on their warning wheel? Um, yeah, it was. See what that looks like um, inside here. So gathering pallets already off. I might normally take the studs out, but as I say, we're not going to do that this week. So let's get the pins out. These might be easy. This one has broken off here. It hasn't been pushed through enough, so that might be slightly more tricky but um let's just start here see how we go on oh yeah the person that put this clock together last time wherever you are i thank you for not whacking it too much although as i said we might be in trouble over the um over the minute wheel stud I'm just going to do this in a slightly different way. I'm just going to. Yeah, it is. It is. It's um. But I think it'll straighten fine. Uh, it's but it's it's um. I can't really see what I'm doing there. Sorry. It's uh. Bent near the base. I would say that would straighten up. And of course it doesn't do anything as in it's not engaging with another mobile, is it? At that end, no, the cannon wheel is right down the bottom end. So the amount of, I'm gonna straighten it, obviously. I'll try straighten it. Uh, so I think we're gonna be okay there. All that, yeah, all that would mean would be, let me get this right, that the hand would track closer or further away from the dial. But I reckon that'll straighten up, it'll be soft. Uh, ish and it will straighten up so cool 
I'll save the worst to last, of course. That is loose already. So that's good. And then uh, the last one here is there isn't anything sticking out. It's, it's either not gone in or it's broken off. Uh, so that's going to be a little bit trickier. Um, let me just have a look at it in my eyeglass. Uh, there is a tiny bit there actually sticking out, probably. You can just see the end of it. So I could either get a uh, punch from a staking set or a bit of blued steel. But I'm actually going to um, just use these um, brass tweezers. Sorry, apologies, tool lovers everywhere. There we are. So that was um, surprisingly easy to get that far. Can't believe it. Good. Right, now, so here's the big reveal. Let's get the camera. Oh, let's go back to photo. Explicit. You would think so. Honest, Derek. I haven't crossed my heart. I haven't done anything with them. They've been exactly as they were. I picked it up, put that paraffin on tonight. I thought yesterday, shall I put um, paraffin on or penetrating oil 24 hours before to get them free? Because normally, I totally agree, some of those would be a complete pig. But they haven't been touched for 30 years, apparently. Right, here we go. Honest. The moment of truth. Ah, no, wait a minute. We're not going to be able to get that off we? Because um, ah, too late now. Sorry. Mess up there. I haven't got the um, seconds pipe off and it won't, that won't pull off. Let's just try that. But I haven't even done it with the, uh, so there you go. I thought I was going to get ahead of myself there. Let's just. See if we can encourage that off. Good. Good old paraffin. Right, okay. Uh, here we are again, second time lucky. I should have maybe put some on the um, on the arbors as well, but let's just go at this nice and steadily. Am I missing something? Oh, sorry, it would have been nice if the doll just stayed upright, wouldn't it? But there's probably so much bushing and gosh knows what gone on. I don't want to go in there. Let's just try and negotiate things back in the holes for a second. Uh, one wheel, ooh, nice rusty pivots. Fly. And escarpment. Go in there. So there we are. Looks great. Very, 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 very pleased with that. Um, so a quick look around before we uh, call it a day and um, just see if there's anything else. Nothing uh, immediate, no horrors immediately. Um, I say this obviously is broken off the gathering wheel, but nice. Nice undercut pillars, really smart work with the graver there. Um, so, yeah, we talked, didn't we, last week about the step on the fly um, hammer spring being worn, but it uh, it's in good nick. It really is a little bit bent. 
we can straighten it out. But remember that the, the bell for this clock, as Jane reminded me, is screwed to the backboard of the case. So that might not be in the so-called right place. Uh, all right, there's, a, there's an interesting thing. Interesting. A little bit of wear under there. And if we, you probably can't see it, but we can certainly feel on the end there's quite a burr somehow. I don't know how that's happened because the pins are obviously moving off the hammer lifting piece. Um, oh, that's interesting. Uh, we'll put this back together uh, later, not, not tonight, but um, another day. Um, I don't know if you can see or not, but the pins look like they've actually been going past the edge of the lifting piece and they've caused a bit of damage there. But again, I'll just tap that down. But what that makes me think is, is that bent? Doesn't appear to be. Uh, or has there been some issue with end shape? Doesn't appear to be. No, this is really nice, nice component. Nothing wrong there. Just check that the hammer shank isn't loose and the hammer head isn't loose as well. It's not, it's all really sound. So that's good. Um, it's going great wheel. We said, didn't we, last week that the, the clicks are, um, let's just get more of this. Crazy. The clicks are indistinct, to say the least. I don't think that's a really, I mean, it is a problem, but I don't think that's a particular problem with this clock once it's clean. Um, remember, what we're looking for with springs is that they're not touching the plate, or in this case, shouldn't be touching the great wheel. There should always be a little bit of a gap here. On posh clocks, they're often undercut. So the foot is screwed down, obviously not in this case, it's uh, riveted on. But then the back of the spring is undercut. So it's actually free from the wheel. So what we'll do there, we can't take these off to clean them. Well, we could, but it would mean undoing these rivets. Uh, is that when we've cleaned it best we can, we'll just do something like slide a scalpel behind there just to lever it out a bit. So there is a gap between the back of the spring and the face of the great wheel. Um, but otherwise that's in good, really good nick. And um, luckily somebody left the uh, pin quite long. If the pin's short, by the way, you can't get hold of it to get it out. You can shear this off. If you rest the whole thing on a compliant surface like this and get a piece of wood shaped to fit this, you can usually knock it down and it shears the pin off. But you can see in this case, the slip washer, I think, is broken. Yeah. So maybe um, something's happened there already. That's actually cracked at the top, but it's fine. No problem there. Um, just in case uh, something happens and we don't proceed with this project, these slip washers should not be domed so the great wheel is tight. There should always be a bit of play between the great, you can see that, a bit of play, that's good. And remember, it's not playing in this direction. It doesn't affect the going of the clock. It doesn't kind of thrash about when the clock's running. If you tighten that washer and um, force, the, force the great wheel against the face of the uh, barrel, when you wind the clock, um, there's a stronger reaction of the train, pushes the train backwards, and unless you stop the pendulum every time you wind the, wind the clock, it damages the escape wheel teeth. And I've seen that happen uh, where teeth have, um, on all the clocks, admittedly, broken off. So this should be left ever so slightly rattly loose. Remember, when it's driving, it doesn't move across and kind of cockle over to one side. Uh, anyway, that's something that, as you can tell, animates me quite a lot. So I'm going to put a bit of paraffin on here. I'm not going to take it apart tonight because we're about done, but we'll do next week when we come to doing our cleaning. Exciting. Center. Ah, right. Okay. Now we've got a cheese problem. See that? A pivot is a super stumpy, broken off pivot. Right. Okay, so there's half a pivot there. So we will uh, need to re-pivot that. Uh, there's no way around that. Um, yeah, 
now I'm not entirely sure. Hmm. Anyway, so I need to think of a way of holding. Obviously, we've got a collet lathe, uh, Shaublin 70 or 102, or something with a nice collet. You can make up a brass holder uh, that holds the pinion here, or you can do it between centers um, by, you know, with a kind of runner and get to the pivot from the back here. So there's another job on our list. The back of the center wheel needs to be pivoting. And um, that's good. Front pivot is in good nick. Nothing wrong there. So a uh, little job for us. And of course the arm is bent. But that's not our challenge here. Our challenge is doing this re-pivoting. Uh, that's that. Derek said that's why they couldn't see it through the plate. Right, yeah, yeah. Because it's only half of this hair. Uh, uh, interesting to speculate why that's happened, whether somebody's broke it off or it's rusted and they've filed it off or who knows, but you can see how long the pivots were when the thing was new. So pinwheel, um, sometimes on all the clocks, the pins get so worn that they kind of need replacing. Well, again, need. This is good, all nice. I'll try to put some pictures on um, thingy on Instagram, but as you can see there, but this pivot is what a lot of people would call scored. Maybe you can't see there. In my view, totally nothing wrong with that pivot at all. Doesn't need polishing, in my view, doesn't need refinishing. That's just another form of kind of accelerated damage. Once this is clean, get rid of the rust, clean up the bearing hole. Those marks have been caused because of a failing of lubrication or contamination, probably rust by the look of it, and the clocks continue to run. Once it's all cleaned out, those marks are going round with the pivot. If they're running along the pivot, I would get it, but um, I will, as much as no guarantees in life, guarantee you this clock is gonna run absolutely fine with that pivot just getting a bit of the rust off. Uh, and the same for this end as well, which isn't as scarred. Striking barrel. Ah, that's interesting. You never know, do you? What like super exciting things are just around the corner. So this has got a screw in it, a later screw. Is it a screw? Yeah. Crazy. So this has got a screw in it with a very, very filed down head, virtually no slot in it. So I'm thinking straight away, how on earth we're going to get that out? Are we going to have to use a screw cutting file and our piercing saw and deepen that slot? Or is can we get a screwdriver that's a really good fit and get that uh, puppy out? And of course, the next question is, why has it got a screw in it? Um, yeah, really, really posh clocks have a screw, but they don't go on top of the spring like this because of course the screw pushes the spring down. In posh clocks, uh, using the term very advisedly, of course, there's a hole in the spring and the screw goes the whole way through, the whole way through. Uh, it doesn't clamp it down like this. So I presume that's later, but, um, and especially since how it's filed, I wonder why that is. Cool, I like a thing like that. Anyway, you can see this one's also broken through, um, the, but the spring's in good nick, uh, but the ratchet is indistinct to the point where it doesn't actually work. But that's all right. Let's get a bit of our trusty paraffin on it. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that center wheel pivot looks well dodgy. Um, it hasn't just like happened on its own, but presumably, yeah, it could have happened when the arbor got bent, I suppose. Or maybe Derek, uh, oh gosh, there's so many exciting things in this clock. You think it's just going to be like a regular 18th century, 19th century long case clock. And um, you see, just not going off the pivot thing, but obviously somebody at some point has gone a bit pivot crazy on this clock, as we know. But just putting that bit of paraffin on their click and already... I mean, it's not safe yet, but it's already just kind of started working. Isn't that cool? How nice. These clocks are really sort of beautifully made and actually kind of want to work as if they had some kind of consciousness that I'm unaware of. Uh, anyway, 
So this is nice. It's a little bit sort of industrially finished, isn't it? It's kind of a bit chunky. Um, but that's going to be an interesting repair to see what's going on there. You can hear the ratchets already working. So good. And um, third wheel. Um, but I'm committed now to calling the upper intermediate wheel. Again, the pivot's a little bit scored, but no problem there for, as far as I'm concerned. The pivot's good. Uh, she's, uh, it's a little bit dusty. And yeah, there's some pinion wear. I mean, that's probably been exacerbated by the clock running when it was dirty, I guess. You can just see the wear there on the recoil phase. And slightly alarmingly, it's worn to the outside of the pinion leaf. So again, when we've done our preliminary cleaning, we can have a look at all that and see whether this needs uh, bushing or not, um, or rebushing in this case, because I think it's already been bushed. Nice escape wheel, really lovely. Um, it's got, um, it's kind of deadbeat-ish sort of style uh, escape wheel teeth, which is really cool. So this is a double cut tooth by the look of it. So I guess it's been cut with a slitting saw to make that first shape there. And then it's been cut with a triangular shape cutter to make the, the second cut. I don't think it would have been cut with a profile cutter like you would do it nowadays. I think this is uh, this is double cut. But just interesting they don't have that sort of curved relief on the front of the wheel, isn't it? Because uh, this rotates clockwise. Yeah, front of the wheel, like, like normal. So it's kind of like a deadbeat escape wheel a little bit, but going in the other direction. Nice. And if you remember the pallets, they're sort of quite angular as well. Um, it looks like there's a mark there on the root. Yeah, really nice. So there's um, a manufacturer's mark, which you just about see here, that they've put on where they want the root of the tooth to be when they're making it. So that dictates how far in they come with their cutter. And then of course the depth of penetration of the second cutter is when you get down to having very little or yeah very little land here so that's nice so this is in good nick uh, it looks reasonably straight yeah no problem there so just a bit of cleaning on that and sorted i love this where you can see the shadows um uh, on the on the plate the shadow on the plate and when we, um, showing my age now, when we uh, finish cleaning the clock, I hope that shadow is still there. I'm not going to eliminate it. So, um, right, okay, yeah. So gathering wheel, same thing, apart from the fact that the end of the ab has broken off. And a bit bent. All good. I haven't seen any broken teeth or repaired teeth or anything so far. So again, yeah, nice and straight, no problems. So I'll just lift the fire so it doesn't get broken off. So this is our um, problem here on the front, isn't it? Let's have a look, our challenge. Good old Glasgow brush. So remember, this is the one with the extended um, pivot, or extended bush, sorry. So this pivot's been shortened, I think. Let's just check. Hmm. Cool. Well, that's really interesting because yeah, the pivot looks a little bit shorter than the other one. Let's just get the uh, middle. Middle's gone on a wall. Right. Yeah, no, good. So let's just have a little visual. So the front pivot is about very fractionally under three mil. 
and the back one is very fractionally under four mil. Um, so, I mean, that pivot is actually really nicely done. The shoulder's neat, there are no burrs on it. It looks, well, we don't know how long it's been running like that in that extended bush. So that really puts me off re-drilling this out and putting uh, a new pivot in there. I would say if that bush is sound and the depth thing is okay, which we don't know yet because we won't know till we've cleaned it a bit, that pivot is absolutely fine. And I think it's, yeah, it's pretty straight. We'd have to look at this um, warning ping, check that that's not kind of bent or, you know, that it's working properly. But as it is, uh, that appears to have been, yeah, it must have broken off. There's no way around that. And um, somebody shot in the arbor, but they've done a neat job. So, so far, pretty happy with that. Um, as we know, our fly spring probably has to go because it's... If we can get it out. It's been pushed around the back of the, the arbor there. And I think when we get the arbor out, let's just see if it'll come out now. Probably pretty brutal process pushing that round there. Let's just see if we can get the arbor out without risking breaking something. Mm. Yeah, that's that's slightly uh, problematic because let's just squeeze this. Mm. So the, the, the problem with doing it like this is actually the friction feels okay. Uh, I mean, it's obviously very rusty, so there is friction there and it does move. So maybe once the rust cleaned off, that would be okay. I think as a vice mark that it's been the vice at some point, but probably this is the original fly spring, the rivets neat. Um, Finished to the end of the end of the fly vein, just like you would expect, going well across the fly. So the whole thing's really kind of nice, but re unfortunately, it's obviously worn, presumably on the back. Is there evidence of that? Actually, not really. I wonder whether. Um, not sure about this, but maybe whoever has assembled it didn't understand it. With that's just too much conjecture, really. And so they pushed it around the wrong side. Um, and it makes it really difficult to get out. So it could be that we might be able to straighten this, which is always tricky because you can't get it off the thing without drilling the rivet out. But maybe that's worth doing because what I expected to find here on the back, which on the outside, which used to be the inside, is a really worn bit, but looks fine. And I suppose it's not been like that from you. That's not the way it's meant to. Go, oh, I don't think. So um, maybe this could be the first job that we'll tackle uh, once we've done our preliminary cleaning because this is relatively straightforward. Get the arbor out, see if we can straighten up the fly spring and so on. So lots to think about there. Um, let's just have a look at this extended. So we've got a couple of things here that are shouting out. No, I'm confused.com. Oh yeah, there we are. Uh, that's the um, extended bush on the inside of the plate, which I know a lot of people would say, you can't leave that. It's terrible. It's bad work. It's bodgery. But that pivot to me looks absolutely fine. We, we'll have a, another look when we clean it up a bit, bit of uh, bun uh, punching up there on the inside of the pallet arbor, bit more punching up there. 
sort of random hammering. Let that bush is slightly inside the plate. Maybe we could redo that. Otherwise, all good. So this is going to be the, the, the controversial badger here. Uh, well, I'd give it a good old wiggle when it's cleaned up. But um, if it works, it works. And I'm probably happy to leave it like that. What's the controversial budget? The extended bush on the inside. A lot of people would say that leaving that was bad practice. All those tomes they've written about practice and published, of course. Sorry, couldn't resist that. Uh, and then we've got this um, bush here, which is let in for some reason. Maybe this just needs um, a rebushing and flush with a plate. We'll have to look what end shake looks like. Just appears to be, maybe it's just moved out. Uh, this I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna clean it, clean it a bit, but leave, put it back in place. So it's, most of the bushes look like the placements. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, well, I think it's nice that the center, um, that's been bushed. Yeah, it's been quite a lot of bushing and I guess a lot of it was unnecessary, but who knows. Um, this is good, I'm really pleased. So the only um, slight uh, horror is the center wheel back pivot really that we weren't kind of anticipating, but otherwise pretty, pretty good um, disassembly that. I just noticed there, like you can see the wear on the hammer spring, little notch in it now. I don't think it was like that from you. It's not a design feature that's actually just worn back, but. Uh, again, we can probably live with that, I imagine. So there we go. So I'll take some photographs and stick them on Insta during the week. And then next week is going to be the most boring uh, thing ever because we're just going to do cleaning. Uh, so what I describe in the book, I've only mentioned the book. I think it's the first time tonight. It's done really well. Is, so it's washing in uh, mineral spirits, the Glasgow brush, our uh, chestnut brush, wherever it's gone. A um, bit of four knot steel wool on some of that steel work to get the uh, surface rust off, but then I'm going to leave it, uh, dry the whole thing, and bear in mind that we could do some more cleaning. And then we'll look at end shakes, I think is probably the next thing next week, once we've, or the week after, once we've got the cleaning done. And then we'll start on that fly spring and work our way down our repairs. Oh, that was one thing I wanted to look at, wasn't it? This uh, here fly spring here. So yeah, it looks like it's had a screw that's broken off as I thought, you can just see that there. Mm, which is gonna be, okay. So maybe if I can leave the extended bush in the pivot, if it works okay, uh, we've already got a compromise here of taking this uh, fly spring off, rack spring, sorry. Anyway, we'll cross that another time. So I think that's about it for tonight, so much excitement. Have a great weekend, uh, holiday. If you're on holiday, brilliant. If you're working through the weekend, then we'll be here too, working away. We'll be on Facebook, um, supporting you. And again, thanks to all those people who are on Facebook, keeping it positive, keeping a good vibe, helping each other try and repair their clocks. That's what we're all about. So you know who you are. Thank you very much. And we will see you on Saturday for Open Clock Club, uh, where we'll be, forgot what we're doing now, or oh, finishing that terrible <laughs> pivoting, and then the rogue tooth. And if not, we'll see you here, all being well, next Thursday at six o'clock. And we've got some exciting news as well about Icon and about an online event we're going to do, but you'll see that on Facebook. So. Uh, great to see you all. Thanks, as always, to Team Open Clock Club here for keeping the live chat going. And have a great weekend. Bye. <laughs>